The board's been is now in session. For its regularly scheduled meeting of March 2nd, 2023, I'm Joey Hargis, Metro Zoning Administrator, and I'll be presenting the cases today as the Coast Department has it, and we'll do so on the wall here by means of a PowerPoint presentation. I'll present any cases and photographs and sketches for today's cases, uh, and I'll, I'll present the Coast Department's uh, testimony. In the event of the item A case that's there, I'll stay here and present my side of the story and then turn it over to the appellant after me. Um, and I'll cover that particular case when we call it, but in the process for that, because it's a little different than our usual variance cases. Um, the, the code does require that all these proceedings be taped, so anyone wishing to address the board, we can't do that from the gallery. Uh, when, when the case is called, if you'll come forward at the time, uh, have a seat at the table. I've got four microphones there. Uh, there are two buttons beside that microphone. If you hit the rightmost button one time and one time only, uh, the little ring around the mic will turn red and you'll know that you're ready to present your testimony. When you do uh, speak, give us your name and, and physical address first, uh, where you reside, and then go ahead with your testimony. Uh, in cases with opposition today, each side of a case will have 10 minutes to present their testimony. That 10 minutes is, is per side, not per speaker. So if there are multiple people who wish to address this board, you'll have to need to kind of work out who's going to talk when and for how long. But in total, each side of a case gets 10 minutes. Uh, in the event of the item A case, which is on today's agenda, I'll go first and I'll have 10 minutes to present my case. Uh, the appellant will go second and present uh, their case for 10 minutes. And then any other party who wishes to address the board, uh, neighbors or whomever, they will get 10 minutes in total. So in that kind of case, there'll be three sets of 10 um, that will happen. Uh, the applicant of uh, the person who appealed my interpretation will have a time for rebuttal and he will be the only person that has rebuttal time. Uh, but but um, the gentleman there will need to save some of his 10 minutes for his rebuttal period uh, after everyone has spoke. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and, and begin today's uh, agenda. Uh, the board would ask if you would please to silence or put your cell phones on quiet. So we don't interrupt proceedings. Years ago, that used to not be a problem, but the signal strength in this building has actually improved and we can get a signal in here after all. So I'm um, turning mine off too while we're here. So uh, with that, I do have some preliminary announcements. Uh, I'll go over those first, just a couple announcements. First off, uh, if you are here for case 2023-23, that's Miss Holly Jennings, at 512 Rosebank Avenue. That case will not be heard today. It has been deferred to March the 16th. That's two weeks from uh, two weeks from today, uh, again at one o'clock. And that's for Miss Jennings's case on Rosebank. If you're here for that, uh, you go ahead and uh, you can cut out of here and we'll see you in two weeks and we'll hear that case then. Um, Mr. Chairman, we do allow elected officials to address the board. And I've talked to Councilmember Pulley. I, I saw he was here. Are there any other elected officials President besides Council Member Pulley. Uh, uh, Council Member Pulley was here for our first case on there and I've talked to him from a procedural standpoint. This board cannot hear from him that the public hearing is closed in that case. Um, and that is a tie vote case. So depending the outcome uh, of, of that, uh, we'll determine whether or not Mr. Pulley can, can address y'all at, at a future date, but on that particular case. But the record in that case is closed uh, for that one. And then let's see here. We'll cover the deferral. Okay, the board does have a consent agenda and we're gonna take care of the consent agenda first and then I'll continue on with preliminary announcements. Uh, the board has a consent agenda and the uh, before this meeting, the chair meets with staff and goes over the cases and if uh, he feels that the, the cases do meet the, the requirements under the law uh, and that the, the applicants have, have presented their case and made their case for a, for a variance or a special exception, uh, he will recommend the case uh, for the other members of the board. So in doing so, I'll call the cases that, that, that Chairman Pepper has recommended for consent. And this will be the, uh, the first on a motion. Uh, the first case recommended for consent agenda is case 2000. Uh, oh, sorry, one thing. Uh, if I call this case and you're here opposed to the case, if you'll raise your hand, please. Uh, just those folks in opposition. If there is opposition present, We'll pull that case off consent. We'll hear it in its regular order on today's agenda. 
so the first case recommended for consent is case 2023-18. Mr. Brad Copeland is the appellant, Greenleaf LLC, the owner of the property at 820B Woodland Street. And Mr. Copeland was requesting a variance in the rear setback um, to allow the use of an existing detached structure uh, for residential dwelling. Are there any parties here present opposed to case 18 on Woodland Street? Mr. Chairman, let the record reflect there are no hands there. Uh, that case has been recommended for consent. The uh, next case recommended for consent is uh, case 2023-19. This will be at the top of page two. Um, uh, Mr. Thomas and Mary Dale Crozier at 108 Brookfield Avenue requesting a variance in the street setback to build a covered front porch to the uh, dwelling. Are there any parties present uh, here in opposition to a case? Mr. Crozier, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, ha have a seat back out in the... Uh, uh, we're just going over consent at this time. You are. Right. Are there any parties uh, opposed to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crozier's request at, uh, on Brookfield? Seeing none, uh, good news, uh, Mr. Crozier, when the board votes here, they'll be voting to approve the case here in just a moment. Uh, the next case recommended for consent will be our final case for the consent agenda, and that is the last case on page three, uh, case 2000. 23-24, Mr. Jorge Flores at 4904 Cypress Drive requesting an addition to a non-conforming residence in RS-10 to construct a covered front porch to the residence. Are there any parties present opposed to case 24 on Cypress Drive? Mr. Chairman, I see no hands. With that, uh, Mr. Pepper has made a, a motion for consent agenda on those three items. Again, recapping cases 18, 19, and 24. Move approval. Second. Uh, I would ask, can we, can we make an uh, amendment to that motion for case 24? Can we just note that it, that, that front porch can't be enclosed? Um, I know we usually do that for front, front porch variances that it, it's you know, covered but can never be enclosed as a as a part of the yeah, as condition yeah, space. That's fine with me. I didn't understand it to be enclosed, but that's, okay. we, we right. should be safe. So I, I'll second with that amendment. Okay. Everybody understand the amendment? Okay, there's been a motion and a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, consent agenda passes. Okay, if you're here for cases 18, 19, and uh, 24, and 24 again, approve with the condition that the front porch is not to be enclosed. Uh, your cases have been approved, with, with uh, and you are free to leave today. Uh, so if you're here for cases, again, 18 and 19 and 23, or 20, excuse me, 18, 19, 24, your cases have been approved by the board. Uh, you are free to go. I'll, as always, extend the offer for you to hang around for the rest of the afternoon with the rest of us, which for the one millionth time I've done this, uh, no one has taken me up on that offer. So. Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to deal with is uh, we have a case that was heard by the board on September, the, uh, September, excuse me, February the 16th, 2023. Uh, it, that case was 2023-17, and as I mentioned earlier, the record in this case is closed, but uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pendleton, um, Pendleton at 1713 Warfield Drive were requesting a variance in the garage heist provisions to allow uh, for the decratch garage um, as constructed. Um, and in that matter, a motion was made and, um, to approve the request. Uh, the vote tied on a tie vote of three to three. And uh, in that case, uh, Mr. Cole is the only um, member of the board who has not participated. And I ask him on the record, uh, Mr. Cole, do you wish to participate in this case? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and are you ready to make a vote on this case? Well, first, uh, I got to make sure I keep this straight for with our legal counsel. Have you reviewed the record in this case? Yes. All right. And and you would do wish to participate. Uh, what what would be your vote on this case, sir? Um, I am voting for. Okay. To approve the request. So, okay. With that, the uh, case uh, 2023 and the records reflect that Mr. Cole has voted in the affirmative. Uh, that case is now approved by the board on a vote of four and three. Uh, so that case has been approved by the board and we'll enter a an order appropriately. Uh, in that matter and send that out to the, uh, the, the Pendletons here uh, first next week. So uh, just follow back with the code depart codes department next week, probably this time next week. Uh, and if there have been any, by chance, any stock work orders placed on the thing, we will lift that immediately. And and uh, and I'll make contact with the contractor. They're, they're free as of this afternoon to get back to work on that uh, case. So case uh, 17 has been approved by the board. And so our first case 
today that we will hear will be case 2000. Can you give us just before you start sure. a couple minutes but carbonate needed to run to ladies room. Absolutely. We'll uh, board will take a, a quick recess. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back. That, thank you for that. It gives me a couple minutes to finish set up. Um, kind of a one man shop today. So thanks for the board of standing recess for for a few minutes. And we'll be right back. Seats, and we'll get back underway. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I've had a request from the appellants in the next case, and that was case 20 on Hildreth. Um, we have that case may take some time to get through. Uh, there is one other item on our agenda, and they, out of their graciousness, have, have agreed to swap places with them. Are, are the board agreeable to hear the case a little bit out of sequence? We'll take the we'll take case uh, 20, 21 first, and then we'll we'll come back to twenty. Okay. Okay. Let me. Um, I'll get I'll get that the that case queued up. So our first case that we'll hear today will be case 2023-21. And the appellant's coming forward now. And, and Mr. Dillard, before you begin, let me go through our presentation first, but please have a seat. Any other parties who are in support of the case can join you. Okay, our uh, first case, the subject property here is, uh, includes uh, Two parcels will ultimately be involved in this development, but the one that's before the board today is is, a, is the area in red here. Uh, and this property was recently rezoned by the Metro Council to MUG-A, and I'll talk about the Dash A districts because there are some requirements upon those zone districts that this board doesn't always see. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But this, uh, this property is owned um, uh, by Christian Schools, Inc., which is... Uh, uh, the the, um, the entity that that, that uh, owns and runs Good Pasture, uh, doing business as Good Pasture Christian School, um, and Good Pasture is just to the west of this site. So, uh, the subject property, as you see on the aerial photograph here, is this vacant parcel that's here. Uh, I apologize. I, I point like you guys can see my pointer. There we go. This this is our subject site, um, and they are requesting variances. Uh, there's a there's a code requirement in the dash A zone districts that when you build a parking garage liner building like our parking garage out here, that three quarters of that fascia has to be occupied by commercial or retail uses in that space. Uh, and most of that dash A zoning we see more in the urban core um, out by Vanderbilt out um, off of Church Street. Uh, but this property was rezoned with that, which, you know, from a, from a planner standpoint, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have. But those same types of standards apply here as well out in the suburbs. Uh, this is um, just on Due West Avenue, just across the street from the former Memorial Hospital uh, and the arrival site of yours truly back in 1972. But um, so this was rezoned as well. So that requirement is what's before you today and sh showing the, the current site pictures of the subject property. Uh, the school does intend to redevelop this uh, western portion of the site to a future time. But the issue here is the um, in the effective area is off the side street. Which let me go right back to the um, aerial photo. This street here um, used to connect to Ellington Parkway, and so this interchange at Due West was realigned some probably 15 or 20 years ago to align Graycroft with Ellington Parkway. So this road is actually now a dead end street. But the requirement is along that street that three quarters of the uh, garage, parking garage has to have the commercial use in it. So um, let me pull, I'll pull up a, another document I have and display it here in just a moment. But gentlemen, if you would please identify yourselves. Let me read to you since it's a, Turn on your mic, if you would, too, please. Just if you'll hit it once, it'll turn red. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, let me let me cover just quickly for you again, Mr. Diller, the code section. That this board has not seen very many appeals from the Dash A districts, but let me read to you directly from the code. And it says, um, and I'm reading from uh, Table 1712-020-D uh, for folks who may be following this. Um, 
that street level parking decks. It says parking decks located at a street level shall have no less than 75% of the lineal street frontage devoted to office or non-parking commercial uses or in districts that only permit residential uses, uh, that space should be residential in nature. And so that's what we've got here. Uh, it does have a requirement of glazing on that wall to be at least 50%. They are gonna comply with that provision, but it's just the three quarters provision that I stated earlier. And I've got the code open here if you have any questions of me, board. And with that, I'll turn it over to the appellants. But before I do, are there any parties here present in opposition to case 21? Okay, Mr. Chairman, everybody else is here for the other case. So uh, Mr. Dillard and, and sir, you'll have five minutes to present your case. I'll keep the time over here okay. and uh, you'll hear the alarm once you run out of time. Good afternoon. Um, I'm James Dillard. I'm direct, Director of Development at Good Pastor Christian School, and I appreciate the time before you today. Um, yes, can, you, we, uh, can you give us your, we, we need to get your residential address for the record, please. Okay, my residential address is uh, 601 Baxter Lane, Gallatin, Tennessee, 37066. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I, we have to get that for the record. So. No, that's fine. Um, Yes, uh, just so you, a little brief history, the school has owned this property since the mid-1980s. And with all the uh, plans and the renaissance that's taken place right in our school area, uh, where the old Memorial Hospital is and uh, different th areas around there, there it, it's really uh, turned out to be a golden opportunity for our school to be able to help do things that we need to do on our campus, like taking care of teachers pay and keep tuition down. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, had a president of our school years ago that found ways to invest. And uh, so luckily we own the 607 building that we refer to here. Uh, it is two parcels, almost four acres, about 3.97 acres. That's uh, located on West to West Avenue. And it's right next door to our campus. And like I said before, right across the street from the old Memorial Hospital. Um, you know, with, with the growth and the changes around the area, we felt like it was a great opportunity for us to move forward and maybe look at redeveloping this property because one, one parcel is like a, just a big parking lot and the other is an office building that's there currently. Um, we went through all kinds of different uh, ideas and thoughts, but we actually worked with uh, Council Member Van Reese and uh, the community, and we had a charrette at the school, and we brought the community in and had different ideas and thoughts of how could we redevelop this property. And so this is not just what Good Pastor wants to do. This is what we heard from the community as we move forward. And um, so as we uh, started the process, we had to go through a rezoning from OG to MUGA, and we did that and had that approved in July of 2021. And then we moved forward to decide, you know, the rezoning did make the property more valuable for us. Well, what were we gonna do? We were gonna, could we sell it, do nothing, or just develop it ourselves or redevelop? And we made the decision to redevelop. We, we think long-term, school's been there almost 60 years. Uh, we think long-term for the community, we wanna reinvest back into the community um, with our project, and the plan was for this to be a two-phase um, project with the first phase being residential and the second phase where the current office building is to uh, demo that building and come back with residential, maybe a little more residential, but our retail office space on that part. So uh, we actually um, move forward, uh, kind of got caught off guard when we... Uh, started putting plans together and told that uh, about the, the situation, the variance that we're asking for. Um, you know, I'm not the expert. I've got him here with me to talk uh, a little more uh, in detail, but uh, you know, one thing that we uh, do know is that the topography of the, of the uh, parcel that we're talking about is quite a bit of drop from the west to the east and the picture you're looking at would be uh, looking toward the east, kind of a, it, that picture really doesn't show the slope real well, but uh, it is quite a bit of topography there. Uh, Mr. Hargis mentioned Briarville Road, where this is questionable about 
retail is, it's um, a dead end street, not much traffic. I don't, we don't think retail or office would work very well on that street. Um, we think that the due west second phase would be where we would need that. Uh, also, um, the, uh, I mentioned to you that we uh, had planned all along to do this in two phases. And so uh, our second phase will, I think, capture that retail office uh, space for us. Um, you know, the, um, the school just wants to be a good neighbor. Uh, we want to do the right things. We want to make it a, a beautiful development. Uh, we just want to be a good supplement to the area. And, um, and it is a long-term investment for us. Uh, my name is Paul Bass, 1009 Orchard Hill Court, Arrington, Tennessee. Uh, building off of what Mr. Dillard said, I've got uh, kind of an example of the phase two that he's referencing. I know it's a little difficult to see on eight and a half by 11, but overall, uh, this project was blended to kind of be a, a cohesive project over the two phases and the retail component that he's referencing is roughly about 7,000 square feet that would fall as a, a center point to the entire development. And like Mr. Dillard referenced along that east side, we have about an eight to nine foot grade change where it falls down to Briarville. And with that being kind of a dead end road, so forth of that nature, we had had heavily landscaped that area and tried to put the focal point on the due west side. Looks like my time of the Okay. Uh, do you need a couple more minutes? We probably well, need a couple more. It was, it was primarily building off what he said, but for uh, overall, we've got the retail office component that's going to serve the entire building uh, in terms of also amenities, so forth of that nature. And once you see the phase one, phase two blended, uh, it kind of helps explain why the goal was to kind of position the retail in one adjunct versus the phase one component. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? Ms. Carpenter shaking her head in the firm tip. Okay. Um, so I, I guess what, what I'm understanding of your hardship to be is the topography of the site, the unique topography of the site. Uh, two things, topography okay. and also kind of feasibility of the east side. Uh, if you were to develop a retail component there with the terrain and the visibility of it, it would not lend itself to retaining a tenant. Okay. Uh, so that's the reason it's uh, to the underside of that deck that we have right now is about eight foot eight. So the best we could do if it were a built out entity would be like a seven foot ce six ceiling, which is a code minimum. Right. So that the other, the east side of the, the west, east, west side of the side would be essentially at grade with the residents to start. You got it. So that, yeah, gotcha. if you look at it from a tabletop, <laughs> yeah. we've got a little leg off to the east side holding up the right. whole due west side. Okay. And that keeps us nice and clean to the elevation on due west. Yeah, I gotcha. Thanks. Looking at your parking, the chart that shows um, the required parking, can you just clarify, are you providing the exact amount of parking spaces that are required for the project? Yes, ma'am, and I do not have civil plans with me, but if I remember correctly, we had an overage of about seven to nine parking spaces for the phase one component. And I didn't see it. A letter in the packet, but you, you're saying you're testifying that you do have a council member support on, on this, or, or you mentioned she was involved in the process to rezone. Yeah, so, they did. Uh, Mr. Dave, I got a copy of it here. Okay, I've had a conversation with her to uh, council member, and they should okay. full support. Yes, all right, thank you. Any more questions for the board? <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to close the public hearing and discuss thoughts. Uh, I mean, I think it seems like a, a reasonable development pattern for the site, and it kind of it's kind of it is kind of a unique situation where it is such a, a long site and it drops over that way. And with it being essentially not an issue on, on one of the sides be, because of the elevation, just the way that it drops off, it does become an issue on the other side. And also, you know, with the kind of the, the spirit of that code is to you know uh, 
to engender pedestrian activity and things like that. And with the current development pattern around there, it's it's not something that that's uh, probably a very feasible thing at this point. Now, if it redevelops, it, it could be more. But um, as, as as the first piece in that, I think it seems like a reasonable ask for the variance to the unique topography. Yeah, and as I understand it, the <clears throat> the garage where they're requesting the variance is on a dead end side of the street. So, I mean, to me, that was the thing that lessened concern about the impact on on surrounding properties in the development pattern, just because I think the idea of it, you know, if it were on a major corridor, I feel like it may have more of an impact than it being on a dead end street. Yeah, I appreciate them having that. Well, I mean, it's kind of the way the site lays out, but having on the dead end side rather than the, the, the corridor side of the property. Uh, do you feel like they've offered to put in the, this perforated metallic architectural mesh panels? Is how, how are y'all? It sounds like you're leaning towards allowing the variance. So how do you feel about that? Is that something you would want to require? I think it's required. Um in other zoning districts, I don't know if it was required in this one, but it's not uncommon to have a parking garage um, treated nicely um, in an aesthetically pleasing way. Um, I personally would rather see the office or the commercial space because that is the intent of the code. And this is a large residential development and it might benefit from a commercial space, but I do understand the other points that are being made. So I'm I guess I'm on the fence a little yeah. bit. Well, I, I agree. I think with, with the future development on, on the kind of other side of this parcel, it's really, it's being, it's, it's, it's officially separate, but it's kind of a, a joint, joint effort there. I think that that will provide some of that mixed use, but you know, who knows well, when that happens and right, you know, it could be 20 years down happen. the road. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Mr. Mink, what are you seeing in terms of the, the topography? Because when I look at the pictures, I don't have your architect's eye. I don't, yeah. well, I don't see anything that looks super imposing to me, but... Uh, I wouldn't say it's super imposing. It's just uh, over the course of a site, I mean, eight to, you know, that's, that's essentially a, a floor of difference. So if they, if they were going to have a, 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 a retail or office component, they'd either have to raise the rest of the building up or sink it down low, and um, neither of those seem like they would be very helpful to the site. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that's something that would be helpful to to get to the where the spirit of the code is on you know fostering pedestrian friendliness to me at least. Um, I mean, we've had projects where we've stepped down the retail. So right. to follow the sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. But, but in your opinion, the topography is a, is enough of a, of a hardship and it makes it makes this piece of property unique enough because I keep looking at it thinking it could be designed in a way that you could put the retail and the residential it could the bottom. Be. Yeah, and, I, I mean, think that's fair. Is this just kind yeah. of a choice or that yeah. I can't, like I said, the topography and not being an architect or a builder, it's yeah, no, I, I think you could design it that way. I think that that's possible, but but it does, you know. Does it rise to the level of a hard drive? Right. Yeah, think yeah. You're, you're saying yeah. you think it does, or yeah, I I, I think it does. You know, I, I could I could see the you know the the, the other side of the, the coin too, and say, well, just you know, figure out a way to to make it happen. But I do think it rises to the level of hardship personally. Um, it, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Tom. No, no, Davis, still thinking. Your light is on, so. Yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Chair, you sort of said what I was thinking about it when I was looking through the packet. Um, I actually, you, unfortunately, uh, like, you know, a lot of family that lived in Madison, so I would get off at Ellington Parkway. Unfortunately, they live. No, not unfortunately, it's just because I feel like every time we have one, I'm always like, oh, yeah. But so it's been a long time, so it's not recent enough, but like, I do remember a time when there was businesses, like my dentist from like five to 15 was in this area, like behind the school. And there was a bunch of dentist office and office space and law office that have now kind of faded away as those people retired. And so now the area is about to go through a resurgence. So I don't actually have like, I was sort of on the fence because I was like, was this a choice? Like, could that it have been designed differently so that they wouldn't have needed the variance? But I also, it, 
they're saying the topography, I couldn't tell from the pictures that the topography was that steep of a drop off to justify the variance. But so I'm just on the fence. So I was just appreciating the fact that you said that because it's been a, a, about a year or two since I've been over there, but I was like, I didn't remember it being that way. But you know, I take Ellington all the time and get off, take Gray Cough to Ellington and pass Briarville Road and all of that. And so you can't tell that from being over there, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. Well, and to me, <laughs> you know, if you, if you raise it up, then you're you're hurting the the other side of it that is at grade. You know, the other side with all the residences, they are at grade. So um, I know that that's you know. Members, I can I've got the yeah. parcel viewer up. Uh, if you'd like to see the topographic layout, I can show that. Please. Okay. Yeah. yeah let me one second. And, and frankly, I think the uh, the the three D view that's in the, in the packet. Uh, the axon view based perspective. Yeah. yeah. So kind of helpful. for those maybe not seen topographic, uh, lowest end here, these are two foot contours. The bold lines are 10 feet apart. So you run from this point here on the west side. You know, I'm counting a good 20 something feet from left to right across that site. We're going uphill as we go west toward due west and the bridge, you know, to give you some context, uh, let me put the aerial photo on. And that, then that's the whole site. We're yeah, that's technically entirely. just dealing with the, the yeah. east so side of that. You're talking about this portion, but yeah. we got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve across that site. And this goes uphill as you hit to good pastures there and then this overpass over I-65 at due west. But, um, <clears throat> Turn off the aerial if it helps you. And that's our subject lot right there. In my uh, presentation, again, I appreciate that because I completely blanked on the street name. But as you see, that street used to run north south and make that connection, and they cut it off here and redirected it to um, Greycroft. So that's our that's our subject sign right, right there. I, I, yeah, I, I mean. I think if you raise the building up, like you, you asked about other things. I guess you could step it, but you know that that creates some other challenges. And uh, I don't know. It seems like a reasonable solution they have to um, to kind of meet the spirit of, of the zoning. Um, and, and and I do see, you know, I do see some level of hardship at, as to, to 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 the site, but. Whether, I mean, you know, I think there could be different opinions on whether that, you know, rides to the level of hardship. But there, and this, I guess, is a question for, for our architects. Uh, in terms of, would there be, if the board were to deny the variance and, you know, and or they were, you know, then to have to essentially balance the site either by, by bringing in fill to level it or by grading it down, would there be stormwater implications from that that would warrant uh, going with the variance as requested. I mean, is that a, I don't know technically what would be the. I don't think I just, you necessarily yeah. have to level the site out. You okay. can just have the first level, just step it. Okay. Yeah, you'd step the okay. the floors, right. the floor plate. Got it. Yes. Can someone articulate other than obviously the financial part of it, because that's what I've heard, because we'd have to Lorraine, articulate outside of what I think the intent, and this is no disrespect to you, uh, what I think the intent of the ordinance is, because we've got no evidence, no proof of what the intent that the, the, the council has. I need a little bit more than finding a way to make it happen without it falling. And that, I think, may not be our very articulate way of saying it, other than, okay, we'd like to let them do it, but how can I get there with what's been presented to us today? And I'm having a tough time getting there, guys. I'm, I can get outvoted really easy, and it doesn't hurt my feelings one way or the other, but still. Yeah, I mean, this is a toss-up for me, total toss-up. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate that. And I, I, I've stated kind of what I think is the variance. And I think also, you know, and, and I know this doesn't 
necessarily right to that, but I mean, they, they've gone through the process with their council, with the community to, to get to this point. And it sounds like there's pretty widespread support. And so it's part of the intent, the rezoning process, the intent was to do what they're doing more or less. And then they kind of found out afterwards that maybe the, the, the tech, the, they couldn't do what they had planned on doing with that zoning. So which is right. I mean, yes, no, yes. I look at our uh, legal counsel, uh, there, but I'm not going to do that first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, okay, uh, Mr. Cole, anything? I don't think you, all right. Well, somebody want to make a motion or a? I'll just say, I don't think it's unknown that there was a requirement to have commercial or office space for 75% of the lineal street frontage. I don't think that was an unknown thing when it was owned. And because that actually, that change happened to one of my projects midstream of the project. Oops. Well, it was midstream and we yeah. had to redesign. So it was that that change has been in effect for probably seven to 10 years. Well, let me say, and I, I respect y'all's architect side and what Mr. Newton has to say. I was on the fence, but when I see the topo map, I'm just not seeing anything that's, I, I just, and I think it's, it's somewhat subjective. Is it a hardship or not? But I just can't, I, I've not seen anything objective that makes me comfortable that that the topography creates enough of a hardship. And, um, and, and if, if it were about, if, if, my, if I felt like my decision was about what fits in and what's, where's the area going and what's, I mean, it would be different, but I, I view it as, you know, I've got to look at, find out is, is there really a, a hardship here that I think supports it, so. Do I hear a motion, Mr. Chairman? Well, I will make a motion to deny the application. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Okay, that motion passes. Well, you got one, one, one opposed. Yeah. One opposed, right. Well, I said it passed. I didn't give the vote count. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you very much. So we'll go to the next case. Just, uh, Okay, Mr. Chairman, the uh, next case before the board is uh, case 2023. Again, thanks to the appellants in this case for allowing us to Mr. Argus, I'll just state uh, oh, yeah. for the Please. record that uh, I will be departing because I've got a recuse from this case. Okay. The record will reflect that uh, Mr. Bradford has recused himself and will be departing from this case. Which Yeah. No, 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 no. Let me, uh, okay, the um, first case before us, and uh, it's case 2023-20. Uh, Mr. Adam Lefevre is the uh, attorney for Seven Hills Club Incorporated, uh, appellant and owner of the property is located at 1313 Hilders Drive, and has filed an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's interpretation of the applicability of special exception requirements to permit the requested site plan located in RS-40. Uh, the appellant is seeking to construct a bubble cover over the existing tennis courts and uh, refer to the board under two sections, 1716.010 and 1740.660. Uh, the appellant has alleged the board has jurisdiction under section 1740.180 item A. Before we begin, uh, the appellant uh, just stepped over a minute and, and uh, uh, asked him to address the board uh, is requesting just a little bit additional time to present this case, uh, given that we've got multiple parties on his side and neighbor opposition. Uh, I promise the board I will not use any additional time that, that it should you decide to grant it uh, I'll, in my portion. But uh, the request, I will ask Mr. Lefevre, if you don't mind, go ahead and present, come up to the board and just on, just on the topic of additional time, if you'll address your request to them. Hello, I think commissioners, you've seen by the brief that there's some complex issues that are more than just the usual case. So I think an additional five minutes, I don't think I'll take it, but I'd just like to uh, have it just in case I need it. Well, I mean, you get, I think there's opposition here, is there not? There is, so I'll, I'll have 10 minutes total. Um, well, that's what you get. Yeah, you'll, you, well, you, your request may to go to 15. Correct. You want 15 minutes. Correct, and I don't think I'll use it, but just so prior. position we get 15 to, of course. Yes. Um, anybody object to that or discussion? I mean, I'd, 
if it's our last case on the docket. So I have, if we were at five o'clock, maybe, but I'm, I'm fine with the extra five minutes. So. Okay. So no, Mr. I don't object to it. I just wish we had this long brief prior to yeah. this meeting. I have submitted on the 17th. It, it was, it was in the packet, I think. I yeah. don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was submitted on the 17th, and then I submitted a supplement on the 24th. Yeah, those, those are both in our packet. We're seeing this. Yeah. So it, you submitted okay. it. I, we got it to today at like 1030. So, but I think what you're saying is you had submitted it to Metro. It just didn't. Yes, sir, he did. I and did. and I, I was present when it came in. Uh, I'm not sure what happened exactly why some of y'all hadn't didn't get that portion of it. Um, and we, we we have a lot of folks here in opposition, I believe, in the neighborhood. So I don't think it's something we want to defer and have people. So uh, I would defer to the, uh, to the chair. Uh, unless I hear <laughs> uh, well, let's start. Does anybody have an objection to the 15 minutes per side? Okay. So. I mean, if that's going to constitute the extra five minutes, maybe that is useful, but I wouldn't be inclined to well, give the extra five minutes up front. I think Mr. Hargis can walk us through it, too. It's, yeah. uh, I just feel a little bad of sorts not having read it. I understand. Okay, so we'll get 15 minutes for the uh, both sides on this. And is there a council person here to speak on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did not see uh, council member present here today. Okay. For this All case. right, so just be 15 minutes for each side. So. Okay, if you'll have a seat again, because I think Mr. Morris will do his presentation and, and you can come back up. Yeah, and I, I'll, um, again, thanks members. I'm, I am subject to this clock as well. So um, this this first portion I'm not, I'm going to present, you know, here's the facts, sort of what we've got here, and then I'll get into my decision. But let me go through the slides first. The uh, subject properties, and I pulled up many parcel viewer as well, the subject site, a little bit better overall plan to show you there overall that the club owns three parcels here and so you'll see the sort of jagged western line uh in the overhead photograph showing the tennis courts that are on that uh, just a little bit a little bit different aerial photo than what you'll see here in just a minute but i want to give that for you i can bring that back at any time uh but the um the subject property again is zone rs40 uh currently it is located um there we go. And then uh, an aerial um, photograph of the of the three parcels that I just showed you there. Um, and the request before you, um, Mr. Fever's client, came and applied for a permit uh, to put a bubble covering over, uh, and I'll let that correct me during this time, but just over the four uh, courts that are, that are here, located where that red house symbol is. Uh, again, not year-round, temporary in nature uh, for several months during the winter season. Um, he met with me. I kind of discussed out um, that, that I believed, and so now I'm going to subject myself to a clock, uh, that whether, you know, whether it had to come to this board as a special exception or whether they were allowed under Tennessee law to expand, uh, I made a determination after... Uh, consulting with him and looking at prior notes that this needed to come to the board as a special exception. And I make that distinction here. Uh, I've included in your packet a letter, but uh, long and short of it is, is that I do not, I, I mean, show some ground shots of the photos too. So I'll pause my time just briefly. These are of the subject side upon um, Ms. Waits's visit to the property. Then views out to the east, across the road, across from the site. And then again, I'll leave the, uh, there we are. I'll leave this slide to slow. Um, this, um, the entity here has actually been to the board, not counting this request three additional times. Uh, originally in 1960, uh, at the time at the County Board of Zoning Appeals, it appears that that was the time at which um, the board in that time approved the use. Get you a copy. I believe I've included a copy of the letter in my letter, um, the original case, and, and a printout from 1977. I'm reading from the 77 appeal. This was a request at that time to install four lights, lights for existing outdoor tennis courts, three existing outdoor tennis courts, 
are lighted, uh, and this was a request for additional lighting out there in, in uh, 1977. It looks like February of 77. But as you get into the, um, the appeal case at that time, life was much simpler. We just had a single page form that you filled out things. But down at the bottom, and the board did grant that request with the condition that the lights are to be extinguished by 11 p.m. each night. Uh, but in the document there, it says an amendment to a former appeal case, case uh, 60-148, was, was that original approval, and it's signed by Mr. West, who was the secretary of the board at that time. Uh, the tennis club came uh, back in 2006 for, uh, I believe, very similar requests to what they requested today, and the board denied their request. I included a copy of the order from 2006. The request at that time was for a 100 by 215 foot bubble over existing tennis courts for four to five months during the winter months was the board's order. Um, again, the board denied the request. So upon uh, Mr. Fever's visit with me to uh, make a determination, uh, it is his contention that Tennessee uh, Code Annotated 137208 applies. I disagree with him. Now, I will admit, and I'll do so on the record, it's, this is a close call. Um, and I have seen his medal in there, and he makes a compelling argument. Uh, but I, I'll stand, uh, I make my argument standing on uh, threefold. One, the club has subjected itself to the board three times previously. Uh, all of those three times were uh, in the 77 case and the 60 case. Those uses were conditional uses at the time. That's the forerunner under Tennessee Code for special exceptions. Uh, really the same functionality the same procedure occurs there that the board has a list of conditions that you must meet. The board can grant variances from those conditions if there's you know, hardship shown. Um, but because of that and the fact that I look at 1712, um, excuse me, 1708030 is the land use chart for Davidson County. It lists out the zoning districts in which uses are allowed and when I come to Recreation Center, which is the category in which we would classify this use, it is listed as a special exception use in RS-40, which in my mind, this use is permitted in the zone district. It is not a non-conforming use, although it may be non-conforming to some aspects of the special exception conditions. The use itself is not non-conforming, and that is my take. Uh, the, the council does allow this use in the zone district with the board's authority and approval. Uh, as as I've demonstrated with the with the submittal in 2006 and 1977 and prior, that the legislative body in Davidson County has has permitted these uses in residential zone districts subject to special exception. I take I disagree with Mr. Lefevre that 137208 applies because in in my mind that applies to uses that are not allowed in the zone district that have become legally non-conforming. Um, I don't believe that this use is a non-conforming use. Uh, from a use standpoint, again, I, I do agree there may be aspects of the regulations that the um, tennis courts do not apply to, um, but the overall use, and that's that's kind of in summary why I don't believe 137208 applies to this particular use. Again, like I said, I, 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 will, I will state it is a close call. Uh, he does make a compelling argument. Uh, just not one that that I agree with him in this in this instance. So, so I uh, give back the remainder of my time unless you have questions for me. I think I might have a question. Sure. Um, so, in your mind, we should be looking at this as a special exception, but is that what's before us? No, ma'am, that is not what's before us. This is this is a, an, an an appeal. Uh, which the zoning code permits the appeals of the zoning administrator's interpretation. Uh, if the outcome of this result today, if you if you uphold me and say yes, he is subject to the board by special exception, then the applicant has a couple of choices. He knows those uh, the legal remedy is appeal to Chancery Court. The other is he files an appeal with this board to come back with their actual submittal to this board of what they're proposing to construct. But this is a procedural appeal at this time. Um, so at that time, if that was to be the case and they came back with a special exception, that would be the time when we can put... Yeah, you could get it. into the, uh, the, you know, look at the plan and mm -hmm. potentially put conditions upon it. But that's, I, I, and I caution the, the neighbors here in opposition, this this appeal, um, and realize that you all don't do this every day like like I do, but this appeal is, is whether 
which party is correct in the interpretation? Is it me that, hey, yeah, it has to come to the board to get approval, or is it Mr. Fever that no state law preempts and and he's allowed to expand without this board's approval subject to the normal building fire code permitting process, but it would just bypass the zoning portion of that building permit process. This is not some, I do want to tell the, 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 the members of the public command, this is not a blank check if if uh, the board overturns my decision that they can just go out there and build it tomorrow. I mean, it, it, it does require a building permit uh, and it will be reviewed by agencies that, that would have to review it for their codes, but it would be um, the zoning code would not apply in, in the, the building permit review. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, no. Ms. Carpenter. Just, just so so that I understand, right now we're, we're clearly taking your posture from what you've just said, because I know we'll hear from the other side here in a second, that the previously submitted to the basically the authority or decisions of this body by their actions in the past, at least two or three times, correct? I'm just trying to make sure I That's answer correct. that yes, part sir. of your comments. Yes, sir. And then I noticed when we were going through the photographs, it looks like there's already some work being done out there. Well, I'll, I'll, let the, I'll let the applicants cover that during that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that there is at least something that's happened out there. Lord knows what it is. Right, but and I don't in any way, uh, and I don't know the answer whether this is in preparation for construction or if there's some other, I mean, they may be reworking fences or, you know, I, I, don't, I don't make a presumption that we're underway here. No, I, I understood. Thank you. Sure thing. Mr. Harger said, yeah, you know, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, has this, has this ever happened before? Like, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, there's all kinds of churches in our zoned areas, other other recreation centers, that, you know, these other permitted with special exception kind of uses. Have we, have we ever, is there, I mean, we don't, we don't deal with precedents, I know, mm -hmm. but it, 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 have there any, been any previous, you know, cases like this and in your time here i know you've been been around a little bit so yes sir uh, I, i'm not aware and, and and i say i answer that say there's not aware and i, and I say that with caution to not prejudice uh uh mr Faber's side of the sure. thing anyone can appeal my interpretation at any time now there's certain stages in which you have to do it you know um like for a neighbor appealing my issuance of a building permit well the permit actually has to get issued first you can't you can't file it based on Hey, we think it's going to look like this, so it actually has to get issued. But but he's met the legal thresholds, and and I don't in any way I'm not making, and I'll let Metro Legal should they decide if this goes to a court to make a race judicata kind of argument. I'm, I don't do that. The fact that they submitted before, in my mind, he has the right to make this appeal. Uh, so I don't I don't want to prejudice him in any way. Um, but no, to my knowledge, to answer your question directly, I'm not familiar with this type of appeal that this board or prior board sitting. Have heard something like this, but okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mr. Any other questions for me? If not, I'll turn over and, and surrender back and bounce my time again for um, for purposes of the appeal. I do not get a rebuttal. That, that that ends my case in chief. Unless through testimony you have a question for me, um, I, I'll caution my legal counsels here. Your legal counsels here. Uh, I may have to answer things with the staff hat versus the zoning administrator hat. Um, so. I'll, I'll wear those appropriately uh, as needs so. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Fever, and or any other parties who are supportive. Um, again, you're, you'll have 15 minutes to present. I'll reset your clock here, and we'll begin after you make your introductions. Uh, for all parties present today, and again, I, I know a lot of folks may not do this like we do daily, uh, the clock does stop for any questions from the board uh, and the answers to those questions. Uh, you know, after I answer the question, if I start, or Mr. Fever, whoever starts going into other stuff, then we're going to start the clock. But I'll keep the time here. Um, sometimes in cases with large crowds, it gets a little contentious where it seems like one side gets more time. Uh, but that's how we handle that uh, in this case. And I apologize to everyone here. I normally have a clock sitting up there by Miss Davis, but Mr. Hargis, uh, I have lost the remote to the said clock. Uh, so I'm going to have to buy another one and replace that for Metro. So uh, I'll do that soon via Amazon. So 
I'll keep it here on my phone. Otherwise, Mr. Lefebvre, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, Mr. Lefebvre, do you want to reserve any time for rebuttal? Because you probably need to tell him now. I'd like to reserve three minutes. Okay, I, I will. I'll give you. A, I'll give you a warning at uh, with five minutes remaining. So thank you. And yes, before sir. we go on the record, I didn't realize you guys hadn't received the um, the brief. Did, did everybody not receive it, or is it just one member? Well, I think we received it. We received it at about 10.30 today, even yeah. though you sent it a few days ago. It's not on you, but we didn't get it till about 10.30 today, or even 11, I think. Okay. So it's quite lengthy. That's why I asked for the additional time. It's, it's a five-page brief. But um, as Joey said, this is an item A appeal. It's not appealing whether the bubble is appropriate. Uh, it's appealing whether Joey, or sorry, Mr. Hargis uh, misinterpreted the statutes and law in denying the permit request to Seven Hills. Um, so Mr. Hargis's position is that, main position is that the property or the use of the property is not non-conforming, and we have a bunch of double negatives today, but not non-conforming is kind of the term that is thrown around. Um, Seven Hills position is one that it is non-conforming in accordance with Metro Code and with state statutes and state law, that the addition of the bubble is protected by the Metro Code and statutes and that the zoning administrator is actually required by state law to issue the permit, that it's not discretionary. And there are three issues to analyze. One are the Metro ordinances, two are the state statutes, and three, the case law interpreting the state, the state statutes. So Seven Hills is a swim and tennis club that was founded in 1961. Um, in the packet, I know you haven't had time to review it fully, but in the packet there's an article that talks about the founding in 1961. There's another article that talks about the construction of these four tennis courts in 1963. Um, as the board's aware, the zoning restrictions relevant here went into effect in 1974. So the club, tennis club and swim club predate the zoning restrictions, and I don't think that's in dispute. Um, Metro Code has a definition for non-conforming, and the definition is a use originally legally established, but which now does not currently conform to the applicable use regulations of the zoning district in which it's located. So as Mr. Hargis said, this property is RS40, so it's intended for a single family, minimum lot size of 40,000 square feet. A swim and tennis club obviously is not compatible with an RS40 district. Um, it does, Seven Hills does have approximately eight to nine acres, so they have a lot of land here, but still um, the use it's used for now is not compatible with an RS district. And so being that Seven Hills is non-conforming, it's um, partially governed by Metro Code Section 17.4.650, which states in pertinent part, the alteration of a structure containing a non-conforming use has to be approved by the BZA unless it's protected by TCA 137208. So Metro brings in the state statute to its ordinance and subjects itself, um, incorporates it by reference. So you have the language of the Metro Code, but they've also incorporated the language of the state statute into the ordinance. Um, so that section 208 B and C has two parts. B and the statute as a whole is commonly referred to as the grandfather statute. So B is the provision that allows you to maintain your business. In this case, Seven Hills was in operation prior to 1974. So Metro is a stop from coming in and shutting it down and saying, no, this is RS40. You can no longer operate as a pool and tennis center. Um, subsection B is what protects that. And then subsection C of the statute is what permits um, enlargements or expansions of the use. So I'm, it's in the brief, there's a lot cited, so I'm only gonna read one kind of relevant portion, and that's the section 208C, which talks about expansions of use. And it states, uh, industrial, commercial, or other business establishments in operation and permitted to operate under zoning regulations or exceptions thereto in effect immediately preceding a change in zoning shall be allowed to expand operation and construct additional facilities which involve an actual continuance and expansion of the activities of the industry or business which were permitted and being conducted prior to the change in zoning. So again, this was in operation legally established prior to 1974 and has remained uh, in operation since then. Mr. Hargis, for the record, I brought um, 
61 years worth of newspaper articles showing that the club's been in existence every year since then. Didn't want to put it in your packets because it was already thick enough already. Um, but then the same subsection C has another line that says, no building permit or like permission for construction or landscaping shall be denied to an industry or business seeking to expand and continue activities conducted by that industry or business which were permitted prior to the change in zoning. So that's why we have the legal argument, is the statute says the permits shall be issued and Seven Hills in this case shall be allowed to expand its operations. Um, and then in the packet, there, I cited two cases, there are many cases which interpret this statute, most of them relate to signage, um, but there's a Dixon County case, and in that case, there was a property owner that was operating, or he said he was operating a rock quarry. Um, and Dixon passed an ordinance that says a rock quarry at his property is only allowed by special exception. And he didn't have a special exception. So he appealed, ultimately went up to the Court of Appeals, and his argument was, I'm protected by the grandfather statute. Um, and the, the opinion continuously calls it non-conforming. It's non-conforming, you're using it as a quarry, it's not allowed as a quarry. And the owner lost that case, but the only reason he lost the case is because he could not prove that his business was in use and established prior to the adoption of the Dixon County Ordinance. Um, it's the only reason he lost, and that's why I brought all this, is to prove that it's in existence. And then the second case, which is perhaps more on point, is a Mount Juliet case. And in that case, there was a funeral home, and it had been in operation prior to any zoning restrictions in Mount Juliet. And the funeral home decided that it wanted to expand its use from just what we normally think of funeral homes and add a crematorium. So they wanted to be a funeral home and crematorium. Uh, Mount Juliet said, no, crematorium isn't allowed on your property per the zoning regulations. The funeral home appealed to the Court of Appeals citing the grandfather statute and uh, Court of Appeals held, yes, adding a crematorium to your funeral home is a continuation and expansion of your current use. So it's permitted. So in this case, Seven Hills isn't expanding the footprint of a tennis court. It's not expanding any land. It's not acquiring any land. It's covering and sheltering four tennis courts that are already in place. Um, so we would argue subsection C, the expansion applies. Uh, a couple other just kind of practicalities. Mr. Argus, can you bring up my photos? So these were in your packet as well. And while we're waiting, I know there's concern Go there they are. You've seen you've seen this photo already. Those are the four tennis courts that'll be covered. If we can go to the next photo, and, and they're going to be covered seasonally. That will from be. yes, from November to March. Uh, it's a is it a two day installation process? Two takes two days to install and take down the bubble. Okay, so these pictures, um, Mr. Argus, if you can start with the first one. These are Google Earth images from Street View, and the yellow arrows I put in show where the bubble would be located. It's, it's approximate. You can't see it because it's behind the evergreens. But this is going up Hildreth Avenue as you progress down. Um, Joe, if you can scroll down. So that yellow arrow depicts where the bubble would be located. It's behind a lot of evergreen screening, which has been there since... Um, the last request for a special exception in 2006. And uh, Joe, if you can keep going. So you can see there are a couple of spots in these pictures where you would be able to see the bubble. That one, maybe there's a gap there in the trees where you could see. Same thing. That's taken from the street that runs behind Mountain View. So that's where the bubble would be, I think. Okay, and we're still on Hildreth. Same thing, still behind screening, still behind screening. That's the view where you could see it. That's coming up Hildreth and Mountain View. So you can see it from that point. And then if you turn on Mountain View going behind the subject property, there's another one where you could see it. But other than that, it's completely screened by evergreens. Mr. Lefevre, the statutes you're relying on, though, they don't, have, they don't bring aesthetics into consideration at all. I mean, that's your position, right? It's strictly if you're legally non-conforming use, and, and you expand the 
as long as it's the same type of operation, if it's a funeral home, it's related, if it's a tennis court. I mean, you're, I, I appreciate your covering this. I just want to make sure I understand. I think I understand your argument is the aesthetics don't, don't, there's nothing in these statutes about whether it's aesthetically compatible with the neighborhood or anything like that. With a caveat. So there's one caveat. You, um, it cannot constitute a legal nuisance, which is a different, different area of law. And I have, um, some things to address about the nuisance. Um, just the visual aspect of it being across the street from you or down the hill from you doesn't constitute a legal nuisance. Um, a nuisance has to be unusual noise or light pollution or something like that. It can't just be, I just don't like the way that looks up there. Um, so to your point, yes, the aesthetics don't come into it as long as it doesn't constitute a nuisance. Um, but along those lines... Let me, let me just ask you a question there. So additional use of the facilities later in the day with that where they hadn't been before during the winter months is that a consideration arising to uh, a nuisance legally no so so and, and this it's not like tennis stops in november and doesn't resume until march i was out there the other day and people were out there playing pickleball um so it's not like the pool is open until, the pool actually shuts down September, Labor Day. Uh, it's not like the pool closes and then tennis stops until March. It's it's continuously, nobody goes out there or rarely in freezing temperatures. I've seen it. Um, but most people don't go out and play tennis when it's 30 degrees. But right now, people have the ability to play year-round up until 11 p.m. And I think the club actually imposes a restriction of 10, but it sounds like there's a, a regulation for 11 that's in the record. Um, but the, to address the 2006, that was a special exception request. And as, as Mr. Hargis um, referenced, there's a difference between a special exception and item A appeal. Special exception is asking permission. We would like to come before you, and this is what we propose to do, and we want your permission. Um, respectfully, an item A appeal here is saying, candidly, we, we don't need your permission. This is by law. This permit has to be issued in accordance with 208 B and C. Um, so that's the legal argument to address a couple of the logistical things. Noise was a concern in 2006. Um, back in 2006, bubbles were a lot different. They had noisy generators, um, that, like you can imagine a generator. The decibel level of the pump that is used in this is equivalent to a, a dishwasher interior. It is less loud than the HVAC unit, which surfaces your house. And so it's, technology has really come a long way. Um, as far as lighting goes, all the lighting is internal. So you've got the lighting on the inside of the bubble, which angles down into it. And Joe, if you could scroll to the picture with the lights on it. I think it's the last one. Yeah, so those, those are the present lights. They're around, I couldn't measure them exactly, but they're around 40 feet and they surround those courts. There's eight of them. So when those are on, you're staring at a light bulb. If you're across the street or on top of the hill and you see the light, you're actually looking at the bulb. With the dome, first of all, it's, um, it's opaque. The only light you see are through some skylights that are in the top of it. Um, it's not, you won't see a glow or anything like that at night. It just has some, some skylights. The dome is shorter or about the same height at its apex as those lights are, 40 feet. So when we say it's 40 feet tall, it's not a rectangle that's 40 feet. It gradually reaches 40 feet at its apex. Um, but so the light will be less than staring at that. The noise actually be less if you've heard people play pickleball, how loud that is. It'll be contained within a bubble. And so that won't be echoing through the neighborhood either. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have or the architect is here if you have any architectural questions about how the actual bubble is constructed or works. Mr. Lefebvre, for the record, you've got eight minutes and 25 seconds remaining. It's talking quickly. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, is, just so I understand your position on this, you, you do believe that, um, that this use is an existing non-conforming use, even though it's allowed by a special exception in the zoning code? Correct. So in the Dixon County case that I cited, it's, it's nearly identical. Um, rock quarry was available by special exception in that Dixon County case. And the opinion goes on and on about how it's non-conforming, but we can't tell whether it's non-conforming because we don't have proof that it was in operation prior to this ordinance. 
But in Dixon County, he could have gotten a special exception. Rock Quarry was available with a special exception, um, but his position was, I don't, I don't need it. And a lot of the times, as, as the board has seen, um, special exceptions can be difficult. You have input. There's a different standard to get a special exception than there is for an item A appeal. Um, the board has to look at compatibility, and you, know, you guys know the laundry list of things you have to analyze for a special exception. With an item A appeal, it's it's simply a this statute 208 C and B. The, well, it not only permits the expansion, but again, the language is repeated shall be issued, the permit shall be issued, and shall be allowed to expand. Uh, and there are very few restrictions in statute and case law about this. Uh, it's a pretty well-settled area of law. Again, the majority of the cases you see are people with signs, and they've got a, for some reason, there are always truck stops, but you've got a truck stop, and it's got a small sign, and they want to make it a really big neon sign, and they're trying to use the statute to say, oh, we're expanding our, our use here. And in those cases, there's actually been um, law that come in and said, yes, but 28 doesn't apply to health and safety, so we're not going to allow you to put a big neon sign here that would impede the view, even though it's expanding your use. So those are the majority of the cases that kind of shoot down people claiming protection under the statute. But as far as building cases, there are very few that don't adhere to kind of the strict interpretation of 208C. Any more questions, Mr. Lefevre? Okay, you're you're going to have some time, and that last answering the question doesn't count against your time. So you've got probably eight minutes left on rebuttal. And Mr. Hargis, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to get this in the record. Yes, sir. These um, it as evidenced by the Dixon County case. If you don't have proof that you've been continuously operating during that period, then it can cut, and you lose your uh, non-conforming status. So this is burdensome, but I'm going to give these for the record. No problem. Here in opposition, you have a total of 15 minutes. So if you want to huddle up and figure out how much time you want to allot to each other, if they're different folks, do you? Yeah, two minutes. Two minute break. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take a two minute break. So those in opposition, you got 15 minutes if y'all want to talk about how you want to divide that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've also get, been given some documents from the opposition. I'll get those passed out during the break as well and, and accept okay. Mr. Fevers. <laughs> Just a reminder for those parties who wish to address the board uh, that may be in opposition or uh, uh, if we've got four spaces there, feel free if there are any others that wish to join these gentlemen uh, to c come up. The only thing I advise you, just on the microphone, just on the right-hand side of the microphone is a button there. Uh, it looks uh, maybe different from yours, but it looks like it's got the silhouette of a human head. If you'll just push that just one time only. And uh, your your light will come on and identify yourselves. Again, gentlemen, the three of you all that are at the table, uh, as we talked about before, and I, I keep the time here, you'll have 15 minutes to present your case, and that is divisible amongst you or anyone else who wishes to address the board. And hopefully you all have had some time to kind of discuss through. But, sir, I'll, I'll start the time after your introductions uh, to the board as far as your names and addresses, please. Sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Clark Tibble. I'm appearing pro se. I happen to live about 100 yards from this proposed bubble. I'm going to uh, step aside in just a minute and let you see a photograph of what they propose to put. And if I can do that, uh, I, I think it'll bring some clarity to this proceeding. And, sir, I, I have passed out to the board members the copies that you provided me earlier. Mr. Tibble, this is what you're, you're talking about, these two right here. Have you had a, ch a chance to look at them? Uh, well, we just got them. These, these are the two pictures you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, we all have those. Up. Do we have members? We all have these. Okay, yeah. So these two right here is what you're talking about. And we'd like to pass those to the members of the commission if they yeah, don't already have them. Every, we had extra copies, so everybody has them. And those pictures are really the 800-pound gorilla in this case. I mean, it, w the English language is deficient in describing how bad they look. We, we have, we have, we, we have got, been fortunate to get 
duplicates of, of, the, of, of a similar uh, uh, structure. And so uh, we'd like the board to look at that and, and, and not and, and, and uh, allow this, this matter to rest as it's rested before in this body. I'm Dr. Joseph Hamilton. I've lived there longer than anybody else in the neighborhood. And can you give us your address, please, sir, for the record? Okay. I live at 305 Mountainside Drive, which is around the corner from the swim club. All right. I bought that property in 1962 when Howard and Smith sold me the property. It's the first lot sold in that subdivision before there was even a street paved in the subdivision. So when I say I have been there a longer time, I know the neighborhood very much. I've been a member of the swim club for 50 years, I guess, something like that of that order. I'm here to strongly oppose the proposal for the, and I want to make the follow for the bubble for the following reasons. When the proposal was first built to build a bubble was brought to the planning commission, one member of the planning commission, when he looked at the pictures like you're seeing, he said, what do you mean this area is like a park where these people live? It's a jewel in Nashville. It literally is a jewel in Nashville housing community. He said, and you want to destroy it by putting an ugly bubble and noise in that neighborhood. Shame on you. And the planning commission voted it down. I don't know how that came back up again. And I don't know how they got around getting the planning commission's vote to no, not do it. But that is the case. Mr. Clark's comment that it's the gorilla in the argument is correct. Our previous presenter in favor of it misled you very much. If you look at the size of that light pole up there and he said that's how high the bubble has to be, that goes way up above, above the height of the cedars. And most of those cedars are now dead. So they're not even there or they'll have to be cut down and replaced. But if you're living in the house across the street, you're not going to miss seeing the whole bubble on that score. So it is a matter of destroying the beauty of the neighborhood and the tranquility of the neighborhood. And I would like to urge you in the strongest possible way to say, look, think about the fact that the weather in the last 15 years has changed dramatically. How many days did we have below 32 degrees in the last four months? Maybe five, maybe 10 at the most. I have seen people playing on those tennis courts every day, except maybe one or two in the last four months. And they didn't worry about a bubble being up to play on that tennis courts. So why fix something that ain't broke? is one of the arguments that I would like to make. They're playing there now, particularly since the weather has changed dramatically in the last 15 years, and it's gonna change more in the next 15 years. So the bubble will be even less useful come five or 10 years from now on that score. So I urge you to not allow that bubble to be put up to destroy the beauty and tranquility of our neighborhood and a place where I have lived for 60 years and I don't want to see it for the next 60 years to be different. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Richard Eggston would also like to speak. I, 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 y I think y'all have plenty of time, so, yeah. Thank you. you I, I'm, tell us your address, Mr. Eggston. I, I'm uh, Richard Eggston. I live at 1313 Tyne Boulevard. I'm here with my mother, who lives at uh, 1308 Hildreth Drive. Uh, I grew up in a house. It overlooks this property. One of the example pictures of what the neighborhood looks like shows her house. She is right where... Uh, Hildreth comes into to excuse me, Mountain View comes into Hildreth. I took those pictures that you have. Actually, the, the picture of the, the evening uh, nighttime picture is was from yesterday. Um, as you can see from the picture, uh, it is opaque on the sides. 
Uh, we are very concerned that you can see the, the light at the top of this, uh, of this dome, and that is at Brentwood uh, Swim and Tennis Club uh, at Wildwood, which is uh, just south of Old Hickory Boulevard in, in Brentwood. Um, it covers four tennis courts. You can see how massive it is. You can look at the cars to see the scale of this thing, which is from the information I was able to gain online is very similar to what is being proposed here. My mother looks down on this property over the trees as was pointed out, most of which have uh, are died and need to be replaced. I, I would hope that the tennis courts and the club would use their resources to replace those trees that are dead and dying to screen. And clearly the club knows that there's an issue with lighting, there's an issue with noise. That's the reason they put those trees up between the road, the parking lot, and the tennis courts. They put them in because there is an issue with noise. There is an issue with the lighting. Uh, and those properties, uh, those trees are dead, with a few exceptions. It's troubling to me that this, I believe this board has already rejected this. Uh, the neighbors in 19... Uh, in 2006 realized something was going on when there was materials delivered to uh, these tennis courts. Mr. Tidwell asked me at Rotary, what's going on at the tennis courts? And I looked over there, went by, and it looked like drainage to me. Little did we know that they were going to do what this board has already rejected them doing in the past. Council previously indicated, uh, talked about truck stops and how building a, a bigger sign and lighting is something that warrants a rejection of um, something, uh, the special exemption, forgive my not having the legal ease. I believe that this is equivalent to a truck side, a pimple on the neighborhood. And I would ask that uh, you accept your professional counsel and that this requires a special exemption and we'll be delighted to come back and testify at that time. Okay, sir, before you begin, just an update on your time. You've got seven minutes and 53 seconds as a group left. Perfect. Um, my name is Anthony Rodi. I live at 1318 Hildreth, which is directly across from the the Seven Hills Bath and Tennis Club, um, and I share a lot of the same sentiment that uh, the founding members of our neighborhood share as well. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone for giving me the chance to to voice my opposition. Um, while I think that some changes are, are wonderful, um, my wife and three children moved down to Nashville from a city of called Lake Forest, which is 30 miles north of Chicago. Um, to escape a lot of the things that are sort of taking place. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to know that there are other neighbors in our neighborhood that, um, that share the same values and sentiment and, and also preservation ideas around their own properties. Um, you know, we, my family does enjoy use of the pool. Uh, my daughter plays tennis, um, and, and they love going over there all, all, all the time. Um, <clears throat> We didn't really find out about this until a letter was sent to us that they almost made it seem like they had already started doing it. Um, and I will speak to the fact that the trees that they have that they claim are blocking the view of the tennis courts, um, they don't provide any blockage. I can count the number of people that are on the tennis courts at any point in time throughout the day. They have old metal halide lights that you know are, are light pollution throughout the night. Um, and, and while I certainly don't disagree that the tennis courts should be used as they were designed, um, I, I would disagree that Seven Hills is, is all that great of a neighbor. Um, uh, I think most of the people on this panel could agree that during the summer months, um, and while we've already um, filed with the city, um, with along with all of our other neighbors, to uh, introduce tra traffic calming, Seven Hills, not that this is relevant to the case, Seven Hills provides no guidance 
um, and no instruction to anybody that's visiting the pool during busy pool days or swim meet days uh, where to park. So we're faced with people parking on both sides of the street, which presents an emergency use hazard. Uh, they leave their garbage in our yards um, and things like that. Um, other than that, um, I've spoken with the neighbors directly to the left of me. So I'm at 1318, the neighbors directly to the left of me or the east. The Follis is also uh, opposed to this, uh, this, this project. Um, there's no neighbor directly to the right of me, but the neighbor two doors directly to the right of me has also opposed that and I appear on their behalf. Um, and their reasons were property values, uh, noise, and uh, overall aesthetics. And while I realize that's not a legal argument in this case, I would imagine that, you know, it could become a legal nuisance. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. But I sit here with my neighbors and object or oppose. Thank you. Thank you. you st I believe you all still have some time left. If you, if you want to make some more statements and may have some questions from the board. Yeah, I was just going to ask for a procedural standpoint. Uh, the the uh, group in opposition has five minutes, 17 seconds, and before, uh, whether you had any questions of these witnesses before you. Any questions from the board? Looks like Mr. I, I, I was just going to make the comment that uh, and, and Mr. Tildwell made this comment to me probably about 40 plus years ago when we were in general sessions together that just because you got the time doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it. But I'll leave that to your discretion, gentlemen. Well, I think we got this. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll wait our seat. We filed. Uh, we just wanted to make them part of the record if we could. And that concludes our case. Okay, thank you. Uh, before you all sit down, are there any more questions for these gentlemen? I don't think in my letter that we, my wife and I sent in that we made the case of how the weather has changed and that people are playing every week, almost every day, tennis in the last four months. So they didn't need a bubble to play. So if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you very much. We'll uh, close the public hearing and uh, discuss. Well, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Cleaver's got 825. Oh, I'm, in I'm, I'm getting ahead. Sorry about that. Right. So, just a few just a 15 minutes thing that yeah, me then I, I will not eat up all this eight minutes, but, but just a few, have, uh, I think seven or eight minutes, a few rebuttal. Um, when we're talking about traffic, so you've got four courts codes does not allow any spectators under this bubble. So it can only be players and coaches Four courts. If every court was used for doubles and had a doubles match that's 16 people on the court, say there's a tennis pro out there too, 17, 18 or there's a tennis clinic that can go up to 20 people. So you're talking about 20 cars, if everybody drove separately um, on that street, parking in a parking lot that has 50 spaces, actually there's a few more than 50 spaces, uh, available to it during the period where this bubble would be in place. The pool is closed. So the majority of the traffic and the parking in the area is for the pool. And as um, the neighbor said, there is heavy traffic in the summer, mainly on swim meet days when you have other clubs coming over and competing in the parking lot of 50 spots just isn't big enough for that. But when this bubble would be in place, parking is not going to be an issue. Again, 50 spots for a maximum of around 20 people. Um, and then the light, oh, I, did, I misstated the bubble. So the bubble that Seven Hills is proposing does not have skylights. So there won't be any light emitted from it. It's completely opaque. If you see the picture um, that the neighbor provided that has that little bit of light at the top, that bubble, that one, you can see a little bit of light at the top. This bubble will not have any exposed light. It's completely opaque. Um, another issue is Seven Hills. Um, Joey, can you back up to, I think, your first picture, the overhead? that showed the kind of the entire property. Sure. I have this. OK, one. that uh, one, two, three. Yeah. Um, so in 2019, Seven Hills conducted a multi-million dollar pool renovation project. Um, and the permit lists that the permit is to completely demolish existing pool, baby pool, 
replace with, um, I think this is an Olympic size pool or something along those lines and baby pool. Also, they put up about a 25 foot retaining wall all along the rear portion behind the diving boards. If you can see the bottom left, it was a massive renovation project. There wasn't an issue with the permit. Um, it's an expansion of the pool. It's a new pool. It's a removal of the old pool and a replacement with a completely larger, different orientation of a pool. And that one wasn't flagged because it was an expansion of the use. And that was fine for the swimming pool and the statute applies. It should be applied to the tennis courts as well. It's still an expansion of the use. Um, and as far as the the pictures with the freeze, the one with the light on it, I took that after the freeze. I took that maybe two weeks ago. Um, and I will concede that some of the greenery isn't that green anymore, but it, it's still there. And none of us know at this point whether or not our uh, plants are going to come back in the spring. Um, do you have any other questions? Looks like we do not. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. I'll go and get the architect's simple opinion out of the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, like Miss Davis seems to uh, ha have familiarity with a lot of the properties we end up looking at. This is this is as a young man at Percy Priest Elementary. I went to a lot of pool parties at Seven Hills, so I'm pretty familiar with this property. And and um, well, I, you know, I, I have. Have thoughts on the bubble, um, but, but it doesn't seem like that's really what's at hand here. And what's at hand is whether this is um, whether this whether a special ex ex exception for this use or this property is uh, relevant or, or or not. If it's preempted by by state law, um, I, I, we have many properties, churches, like I mentioned earlier, churches, recreation centers throughout the city that they regularly come to us with some, maybe not this exact request, but requests to um, add on to change something about it. And that goes through a special exception process. And um, I frankly don't see why this would be any different from that. Um, I, I don't see um, in any way that, 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 you know, makes this special uh, per se. So um, with that, I'd have to lean towards the, you know, Zoning Administrator's ruling that, I mean, it's this, this should go through the special exception process. It does appear that it was a approved conditional use, you know, from before the zoning code was established. And, you know, it's kind of been upheld with that all the way through. And it, you know, there is continuous operation over whatever, 63 uh, years. So um, I, I, I have to have to side with Mr. Hargis and his interpretation of that. Okay, so I'll uh, let me. I'll just get this out of, way, out of the way up front. I, I think the zoning administrator erred, and let me say, if this had to do with aesthetics and how it looked, I, my vote would probably be different. And let me also say, I, I made that decision reading these materials because to me it's strictly a matter of law. I didn't know that. I know Mr. Tidwell from way back as a excellent lawyer. I was fortunate enough to be able to work with him some, and. Um, I get the neighbors. I didn't know any of y'all would be here, and, I, and I'm just saying I made the decision reading the materials, and I really appreciate the neighbors' um, concerns about the aesthetics of this, but um, I see this as governed by a state statute, and this is a legally non-conforming use. That is the status of this property. It never, it, they never obtained a special exception. Their status is a legally non-conforming use. Um, and I, I don't think it's quite as close. I think it's a close case. Um, but, you know, under state law, if it's a close case, the tie, in my mind, under our case law, always goes to the property owner and upholding the property owner's rights. I also looked at this Dixon County case, and I... I mean, the court lays it out right there to, to, to have the protection of the statute. You have to make two showings, and they, to me, have clearly been made in this case. First, you have to show that there has been a change in the zoning 
which there was, this club was in existence, and then in 1963, the zoning changes because we have a zoning code. Um, second, they must show that there was a permissive operation of a business prior to the change, and there was a permissive operation of a business. It was a tennis court and, I mean, it was a tennis club and swimming club. So, and I emphasize the neighbors, you know, I, if, if I thought my job had to do with the aesthetics of this, and I totally get your concerns, um, but uh, I, you know, I feel like that um, this is a legally non-conforming use and that the administrator here. Mr. Chairman, if I could just make one disclosure, because I don't think it affects my actions in this case. I obviously know several of the folks out there, including being in Rotary with Mr. Tidwell and Mr. Exum, and I just want to make that disclosure. It does not affect how I would proceed forward. They sit on the other side of the room when I do show up, so we'll just leave it at that. Can I ask the chair a question about sure. this reasoning? So I'm on the fence, and um, I guess my question is, typically whenever we see a legally non-conforming use case, one of the questions that we ask is, is there an addition to the non-conformity? Like, does this increase the non-conformity, right? Because right. we recognize things have been grandfathered in, and then it's because it was grandfathered in, they continue to use it. So I guess my question is, like, why wouldn't that analysis apply here? Because the statutes that the applicant is relying on apply, and they, they're what govern, and they say that, I mean, they just lay it out. If you're operating the same kind of business, like the case where you have a funeral home, they decide they're going to build another building and have a crematory, and the court said that's the same type of business. So, and, I, and you're right. I mean, we do sometimes look at how much it increases the non-conforming use, but if you look at those the statutes, they just don't require that. They just say basically if... If you're a legally non-conforming use, you can expand the business. But if that's the case, then any, almost any existing, you know, special exception that came to us would be completely not valid because, I mean, I, I, I just, I think of so many, so many that we looked at over the years that have come to us and like as Ms. Davis said, have shown an increasing non-conformity but that just doesn't. I mean, would that, 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 that if that was the case, those same statutes would would apply to those, and those those would be rendered invalid. So, um, I just I'm having a hard time understanding why this why it applies in this case, in this case only, uh, or, or you know why that why that why an increasing nonconformity does not apply. Yeah, and I just can't remember. You know, I can't yeah, put right. my arms around those sure. case. I just okay. I mean, the statute to me is says what it says and uh, I mean you know and I think like I said uh, I, this may end up it, it's Mr. Lefevre said something about it doesn't offend us when we get appealed I mean so this may end up with a court uh, may well end up with a judge deciding that you know somebody's interpretation is right and somebody is wrong um, so you know that's, judges. Uh, that's right that's I have one more question for you, Mr. President, sure. and I'm only picking on you because, you know, I admire you and I think you're really well, smart. I appreciate it. So <laughs> I have one more question. So when I look at the statute and uh, it says um, expansion on the property owned by such industry or business situated within an area which is affected by the change in zoning so as to avoid nuisances, nuisances to adjoining landowners, I guess in your mind, it, this didn't trigger a nuisance. Is that what you're going to? I'm, that, I was assuming that. Right, yeah, I mean, to okay. me, a nuisance is um, it's a substantial unreasonable interference with your use of the property. Uh, like, you know, you're running a factory 24 hours a day or you're emitting some kind of noxious odor. Um, I, I'm not aware. Of, there may be out there, may be out there. I'm not sure that I've ever seen a Tennessee case where a nuisance had to do with aesthetics. It's usually air pollution, noise pollution, um, I just don't, to, to, to me, I don't, it, it, there may be a case out there. I, I did not dig dig into that issue, but uh, to me, I don't see it rising to, to the level of what the law would consider to be a nuisance. Okay. And so I guess this is where I slightly, this is where I'm, I think it deviated in my mind. 
I don't think Joey aired, but let's say I did think Joey aired <laughs> or Mr. Hurricane's aired. I don't know, like I look around this area and it's a residential area, right? And I think there's tennis courts in a lot of residential areas in Nashville. Like I can think of the tennis courts at McFerrin Park in East Nashville, but they're not covered, but they're tennis courts, right? In a park. And there's other parks throughout Nashville and neighborhoods where there's tennis courts. I think when you put a bubble over it, it interferes with like the residential quality of a neighborhood, which then would be a nuisance to the like enjoyment of that neighborhood in that area. That's where my mind is. I could be wrong, but like when I, I don't know if Joey, or, excuse me, I don't know if the zoning administrator here, but let's say I accepted their argument and said that you, I assume that you're right. And then I look at this statute, I guess when I heard the neighbor's testimony, which Mr. Tidwell gave me a line that I'm now going to use against other people. Uh, so I appreciate him giving me that. So thank you that the English language does not, is a, is a deficit in the English language that does not define how bad this is. I just want you to know that I will use that and I will give you attribution credit. Um, so, um, I just, so I guess that's what I'm thinking, even if I accept uh, Mr. LaForce's very well-reasoned argument, that's the only flaw I found in it. But I could be wrong. So that's it. Let me say, for the record, I think there's no doubt in my mind that to, to the neighbors that it, it is a nuisance. I mean, I, I I believe them in that respect. I just, where I differ is what is the statute talking about, so. And like I said, I think you're really smart, so. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of properties in Nashville that were zoned a certain way or built a certain way before the zoning ordinances went into effect, and this one what this, these tennis courts and this swim club was built before that time, but so many other buildings in Nashville were built before that time too. So in a way, the argument was it, it wouldn't apply to any building. The new zoning code wouldn't apply to any building, and I don't think that's the case. And I'm just going back to what um, the zoning administrator said about um, looking at the zoning code and a recreation centers listed as a special exception use in an RS zone, RS 40 zone district. And I guess he won me over with that simple fact. I guess the question would be, yeah, that does, does a special exception use constitute a conforming use or a non-conforming use? And, and I, yeah, I agree with Ms. Carpenter that with, with a, um, since there is a, a, it's permitted as a special exception, then that would, to me, uh, constitute a conforming use under the, under the code. So that, that therefore, the, his argument of a non, continuing non-conforming use would not apply there. Well, does somebody have a motion? Because it looks like it's. I'll make a motion that we um, we uphold the zoning administrator's um, decision and deny the item A appeal based on the fact that we uh, that we as a board found that the zoning administrator did not err in his determination of ex applying the special exception to this property. Is there a second? Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. All opposed, uh, it passes five to one. So. Can, can I at least say one thing? I thought that, that the uh, proponents for moving forward did an incredible job. I think you did a hell of a job, really good. Um, and notwithstanding Mr. Tedwell's colloquialism that he has now shared with I'm gonna quote him again. I understand. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you to the neighbors and to everybody. So, yeah. Okay, uh, that, that's our last case. Isn't it? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, that so motion to adjourn. Second. All right. <laughs> We're adjourned. All right. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.